Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about my top seven sweet spots. Now, this is a bit of a follow-up to a video I did several years ago now. I, I can't remember quite when that was, but because of the nature of this subject and the ever-fluctuating supply and demand and the prices and all the rest of it, it's due for an update, but I thought I would focus on Swiss luxury watches today all under $2,000 and you won't believe some of the bargains you can still find and by the way guys I'm going on prices from Chrono24 and eBay of course. Um, now a little disclaimer if you're new to buying vintage I recommend checking out a video I did um, also a while ago, donkeys ago, uh, on 10 questions you must ask, sorry <clears throat> losing my voice there, <clears throat> excuse me, 10 questions you must must ask uh, whenever buying vintage. I highly recommend you, you, you check that video out um, just to, you know, safeguard you because it can be a minefield, uh, especially if you're new to it. And, you know, I've made tons of mistakes, so I was sharing from my past experiences. Now, of course, I've got to do wristwatch check, and funnily enough, it's one of the brands I'm talking about today, and yes, I'm wearing the Navi. i got to say, it's it's becoming one of my favorite watches of all time. I put it off for many, many years uh, buying the Navi, and I'm so glad I, I have. It's two years, two years and a, and a couple of months now uh, that I've owned it. Um, what more can I say about the Navi apart from Miles Davis wore one, so can't really get cooler than that. So anyway, yeah, back to my top seven. So Breitling, first of all, as we're talking about in the Navi time, I take a look at the Jupiter. So the Jupiter is basically a quartz version. Have a look at the A59027. Also check out, uh, you can definitely buy a Super Ocean. References like the A1730, those are automatic. And that is probably my favorite version because it's a, a really tough, the Colt especially and the Super Oceans are interesting because they're not really dive watches. They're not really field watches. They're not really aviation watches, they're all a bit of everything, um, very cool watches. And of course, because it's Breitling, they're all chronometer certified. So if you go quartz or um, automatic, you're guaranteed that performance. Another reference to check out is the A17380. Uh, again, I reviewed a, a new version of that not so long ago. Outstanding watch for the money. You can definitely buy those under two grand. 41 millimeters. 500 meters water resistant this time. These really do make fantastic everyday watches. Masculine, macho, bold, extremely well made. Always check out, have a look at the aerospace. These are famously any digi watches. Bit of an acquired taste, but an iconic watch nonetheless. And it's all operated by the crown. If you've ever handled one, they're very cool indeed. And you know, you have chronograph, um, all kinds of different functions. Very thin titanium. I'm not too knowledgeable about the new ones, uh, but the, the old ones are definitely, you can still pick them up from a, for about 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, that kind of range. And if you're lucky, you might find a B1, uh, like the reference uh, A68362. So those are slightly newer. I think those are also in stainless steel. Not quite sure, you'll have to double check, but amazing value for the money. I, you know, you can't beat Breitling, hugely iconic uh, brand indeed. So very, very cool. Moving on, uh, so number six, so that was number seven. Moving on to number six, Cartier, a, a, a family favorite of mine. Uh, I've bought uh, my wife, uh, um, a, what was it? The uh, Cartier Tank Solo, the XL, which is in stainless steel. Yes, it's a quartz watch, but we cannot deny how iconic. And I'm going to be saying iconic a lot, so I do apologize. But the tank, it's been going for a hundred years now. It's been one of the longest lasting iconic watches of all time. To me, it's synonymous with elegance and class and sophistication. Look at Jackie Onassis, look at Princess Diana. Even Muhammad Ali wore one. If you think uh, you're too masculine or macho for one, well, 
he could prove you wrong, certainly. If you're on a budget, have a look at the uh, Must de Cartier, which is a more affordable version. You can get them in uh, sterling silver, but they are sterling silver with, most often with vermeil, so they're, they're uh, gold plate on top. But the, the gold plate does last very, very well. But you get everything that the standard tank has. That beautiful sapphire cobuchon, the crown, those classic Romans, if you want Romans, there are more Art Deco versions available. You can pick these up from about a thousand to two thousand. Now these are quartz and, and I don't have an issue with quartz watches whatsoever. And in fact, I gotta say my wife does prefer them. She doesn't have to set them. My wife does tend to switch watches to match her outfits. Well, I'm just as guilty as that, I must admit. But yeah, women do that perhaps a little bit more. Um, Maybe, is that a stereotype? Well, it's true, it's true. Now, if you want something a little bit kind of left field, check out the Cartier Centure. Now, this is a very interesting octagonal shaped watch. Uh, and you can actually get this in solid yellow gold. I'm not sure about other precious metals, but you can, I have seen them for solid yellow gold. Quartz again, very, very classy, very understated, small, beautiful little dress watches. So have a look out for those as well. What more can I say about Cartier? I think they have got a little bit of um, a bad rap and they're seen as a, a fashion brand, but they have real horological pedigree to their name. Um, and you, it's undeniable. Um, so yeah, I, I'm always gonna recommend Cartier, especially at this price range. They are true luxury watches, nobody can deny. So moving on, number five, uh, what have we here? Well, another Swiss heavyweight, it is of course IWC. I've reviewed several, uh, including the Portuguese and the uh, engineer, I think it, it was, yes, yes. Um, now you're not gonna get those <laughs> under two grand, but you will be able to pick up a lovely little Portofino automatic. This is a three-hander, more contemporary, tasteful, elegant, and of course you get that IWC quality. The real sweet spot when it comes to IWC is their vintage offerings. You can pick up something like the Caliber 853. There's a ton of them for very, very affordable prices. I love these old vintage IWCs because they still have that italicized international watch company written on the dial. There's something very classy about it. I, I don't know what it is. It just has an elegance. These again, most of the time are no dates, simple three-handers. So you're getting them in mid-century sizes, but they're packed full of style and class and they're timeless, they're timeless classics. Now, if you want something even more classic, check out the Caliber 89. These are hand wound 36 millimeter, very simple pieces from the 50s and 40s. And you can actually find them in solid yellow gold as well. Incredibly stylish and elegant and classic. And everything I look for in a, in a, in a tasteful dress watch. That really is the sweet spot for IWC, and there's no end of them. You can, so they come on the market all the time. Okay, so that was number five. Uh, what is my number four? Well, it's got to be an old favorite, JLC. Yes, Jaeger Le Coultre. Um, if you haven't watched my behind the scenes video uh, at the factory, I urge you to see it. Um, in fact, actually, we could almost say you could, well, you can get an Atmos clock, certainly for under two grand. I bought one for, what was it? I think about $600, you know, so, but anyway, we're talking about watches. Let's get back to watches. The fantastic thing about JLC is that you can get some of their most recognizable and famous watches of all time. So we're talking 50s, 60s, Memovox, especially made, I think, more desirable by uh, Mad Men in, in, in the recent decade. But these are fantastic mechanical alarms. Uh, if you've ever handled a Memovox, I urge you just to have a play around with them. They are fantastic. They have a second crown to, to, to move the um, this kind of, it's almost like a mystery dial in the center of the, uh, the dial to set the alarm. It's quite rudimentary, but they are very, um, well, they were ahead of their time when they came out. After all, this is a mechanical timepiece. This is way before quartz. So we kind of take it for granted, uh, this simple complication. So we're talking, uh, you know, have a look at the Calibers 814, uh, Calibers K911, the K825. Uh, those really are what you're gonna find 
uh, the most common at this price range. Quality, condition, it obviously is gonna, is gonna vary. Um, and the style does vary if you go for more 50s or 60s. So you can't get the Reverso, but you can get one of their, probably, I think it's a bit in the shadow of the Reverso. I mean, we, we do forget the Memo Vox. Another hugely important uh, watch for JLC, or watches, I should say, is their military watches from World War II. You can find some astoundingly beautiful 1940s military watches, manual wind, obviously, you know, simple Arabics, three-handers, and some of them have actual genuine historicity to them. Really can't be beat because you've got that horological muscle of JLC with their famous in-house movements. If you saw my video, The Toy of the Factory, it's mind-boggling. Their contribution to horology is never-ending. I mean, it's massively important. They, they, they really should be up there. Oh, and we shouldn't neglect to mention another favorite, probably a, a forgotten classic, is the Powermatic. And we're talking about the Caliber 481 in particular. Now, this is a bit of a forgotten classic because it made history of being the first automatic watch to feature a power reserve indicator. In fact, VC, Vacheron Constantin, used components of this uh, from JLC in some of their pieces. Just goes to show, you know, the Holy Trinity taking, you know. Um, but massively important and kind of forgotten about. I, I think I saw one in the JLC museum when I did visit them. Again, slightly overshadowed by the Memo Vox and the Reverso, but you can pick these up for an absolute bargain, thousand to two thousand dollars, depending on quality and, and um, not quality, sorry. Uh, What's the word? Condition, there we go, sorry, my mind. Okay, so that was, what was that, number four? Number three, an old favorite, and that is, of course, Tudor. Uh, Rolex's uh, smaller brother, um, doing massive, big things now on their own. In the last few years, Tudor have excelled, but the sweet spot is their vintage offerings. You guys know I have a definite penchant for their day dates, or I should say date day. They did want to differentiate themselves from the Rolex, uh, their cousins uh, at Rolex. You do get the Oyster cases, so you get some of their technology, but what they do, as we all know by now, they put their ETAs in it. And actually, I must mention, I just recently serviced uh, my day date because it was, it, it needed the service. It was performing a little bit erratically. I sent it off to Saltzman. A complete service of their ETA cost me 200 bucks. You can't beat it. Certainly more affordable than servicing a Rolex. So I must add that little, uh, little bit of uh, information. So the sweet spot is definitely their prints dates and day dates or day date day, sorry. So for the prints of dates, which is just the date, have a look at the reference 72034, 74033, 74000, etc. Very much like its cousin, the date just, the amount of dials, the amount of, you know, different bezels, different bracelets, uh, different combinations, different textures on the dial, Roman numerals, batons, salmon pink dials, uh, champagne, just black, um, linen dials, it never ends the combination. So you can really get something that, that you know speaks to you. And of course, the versatility, just like a, a date just, they're extremely versatile. You've got that Oyster case, which is of course the Rolex technology. So it's uh, water resistant to 100 meters with the screw down crown. Very difficult to beat and a very strong, you get that robustness of the ETA as well, that reliability. If you go date to day, I recommend, my personal favorite is the 76200, which is their last model before they changed over to the Glamour, so you get the sapphire glass. Uh, interestingly, you still get drilled lug holes on some of them. Check out the older models, the 94613. Those are gonna be a little bit cheaper because you haven't got the sapphire, etc. You can get two-tone steel. Another little sweet spot I've spotted is the Tiger Hydronaut dive watch. All the Tudors I've mentioned are automatics. This is also automatic. Pick these up for around the $2,000 mark. As the Tudor subs become even more desirable and, you know, start creeping up three, four thousand dollars the Hydronaut's kind of been left behind. It's slightly different. It's got these very broad arrow hands and this quite sculpted looking bezel. It's, it's, it's dramatically different from your standard Submariner looking uh, dive watch. 
It's also 200 meters water resistant, so you've got ETA in there again, 40 millimeters, which is, you know, suits a lot of wrists. And they come in a variety of dial combinations. You've got uh, gray, blues, blacks, even a yellow. Um, so very cool. Nobody ever mentions them and they're still vastly underpriced. But generally, the Tudor Princes, they do have a timeless design about them. Can't accuse them of being homage because technically it's still, you know, some of them even have Rolex signed parts. It's still part of that family. So um, yeah, very, very cool indeed. You can never go wrong with the Tudor. So what was that? That was number three. Moving on, ah, Universal Genève. Now you guys know I recently bought, well not recently, it was before uh, Christmas, it's been a couple of months now, I bought a, a darling little two-hander, ultra-thin Universal Genève Calibre 42 off the Japanese market. I only paid 200 bucks for it, absolute bargain, incredibly elegant. Now it was gold-plated, but you get an in-house movement, beautiful blued hands, that stunning um, linen dial, and there's a ton of them. I, I spotted one with an interesting wooden style dial I've never seen before. Now, Universal Genève is a fascinating brand. If you saw my jewel where I compared it rather cheekily to, to a movement watch, I wanted to compare what you could buy off Amazon for 200 bucks, basically, to something off the vintage market. I went into the history of Universal Genie. Now their history, if you watch that video, is, I mean, I could do a whole series of videos just on Universal Genie's history. They are amazing. And I totally get it why some watch connoisseurs just go crazy about them. They are incredible. Now it's not an accident that they're famous for their chronographs. They actually created the first uh, chronographic wristwatch, I think 1917, all the way back then. I mean, look, look I'm not going to go into their history because we'll be here all day. Uh, but you can buy some fantastic mid-century uh, mechanical timepieces with the micro rotor, another invention. Now, it is highly kind of debated who invented the micro rotor first, but um, technically speaking, Universal Genève were the first to patent it. There were some other prestigious watchmakers that, that kind of were developing their own version of it at the same time. Uh, but Universal Genève did were the first to patent it. That's, that's without a doubt. So I have a look at calibers, uh, the caliber 21527. These are three handers, beautiful, ultra, ultra thin. Have a look at the white shadow and of course, the golden shadow uh, from the, uh, all the way from the 50s to the 70s. The earlier ones were more ultra thin. The later ones, some of them had unisonic movements and Accutron movements inside as well. So very, very cool. Now, of course, we cannot mention UG without uh, talking about the pole router, designed, of course, by Gerald Gentra. No, no, wait, sorry, Genta. I always do that, I always do it, Genta. Sorry. It's my favorite of his watches. To me, if I had to pick any of his designs, it's got to be the pole router. It's gorgeous. You can still pick them up occasionally under two grand. It's not gonna be uh, solid gold. You, you might find a steel one, maybe a gold plated one. Now the very first ones were introduced in 1954 and they had the bumper, you know, bumper automatics. Um, then they introduced the, uh, the micro rotor to them a little bit later. Uh, those, in my opinion, are the ones to get because you're, you've got the combination of an iconic watch like the pole router designed by the, you know, a god of horology and movement muscle with the, uh, the micro rotor. So it's a, it's, a, it's a strong combination. True horologists, true watch enthusiasts, connoisseurs are, are really gonna respect you. And, and I think it's something you can be ultimately proud of. The chronographs, I gotta say, you're gonna, you're very lucky if you can get a chronograph, a UG chronograph at that price range. You might be able to find a triple calendar. It's gonna be in a bit of a state, certainly uh, bashed about a bit, but, um, if you're lucky, you might find one. Okay, so that was number two. Number one, and it's gotta be my number one. I could do, again, I could do a whole video, actually a whole series of video on this one brand because they simply dominate when it comes to Swiss luxury watches. 
it is of course Omega. Nobody can deny it. In terms of value for money, in terms of the variety, you, you've got everything from the Seamaster, uh, you've got the 70s Dynamics, you've got um, the Speedmaster, of course, you've got what else have you got? The, the Constellation, Chronometers, and even in each uh, line, you have a whole plethora, a never ending plethora of choices. I wouldn't know where to begin. I'll, I'll just name a few favorites. Uh, so the Seamaster, well, guys, you know I've bought <laughs> how many Seamasters? Seven, eight Seamasters, I've, lo I've lost count. I can't keep track. So you've got the 70s ones, you know, with those funky cases. You've got the newer Bond ones. You've got the real old vintage, very classic, more kind of towards the dress watch side rather than actual diving watches. It never ends, it never ends. Speedmasters, well, of course, you've got the uh, the reduced, the famous reduced, which I'm considering. The real sweet spot is the 351050, which is the older version. Um, you can still pick those up from about 11, 1200 to 2000 and beyond, depending on condition. Um, the newer one, which I'm kind of after now with the, with the Sapphire upgrade, the slightly more Speedmaster Professional dial with some of the numerals taken away, that is the 353950. That, unfortunately, it's gone over $2,000. I know in my previous video about speedies at this buying used speedies you, you could pick them up 1500 well unfortunately that ship has sailed however you still can get very nice racing speedmaster racing versions uh, all kinds of different dials also check out the date version the 351150 and the 351350 probably the best value in terms of bang per buck are the triple dates you can find a, a 352050 or a 352380 uh, for well under two thousand dollars especially from Japanese used market. The great thing about buying vintage Speedmasters, especially I think with the 60s, the 50s, you know, the early Speedmasters, sorry, Seamasters, um, Cosmics, etc. There's tons of parts around, spare parts, so they're quite affordable to repair and maintain. I've I've bought tons of them. Have a look back in my previous videos, guys. I um, shout out to my good friend Kenny, Triad Vintage Watches. Who else? In fact, actually, I might do a video just on my top used watch dealers uh, because they they're always inundating me with emails, and I have to kind of ignore. I'm like, there's another another Amiga I want. We should mention the constellations, the the Pi Pan dial constellation, the chronometers. Amazing, gorgeous, gorgeous, and you might even get solid gold ones. So, I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. A heavyweight Swiss iconic brand that is world renowned as Amiga, in a precious metal, you know, and, and if you buy 50s and 40s, that's gonna be in house as well. So you got some real horological muscle. I can't recommend Amiga enough. They dominate, they really do dominate. So if you wanna go uh, vintage Swiss luxury, uh, that's uh, definitely the way to go. Okay, a couple a couple of honorable mentions. I could have made this a top 10, uh, but I, I feel I need to kind of investigate these, the following three brands a little bit more first. We've discussed Gerard Perrigo uh, in, I think it was my top 10 underrated or most unappreciated, something along those lines video. Um, Gerard Perrigo are hugely underpriced. It's a Hort Horology brand, still making in-house movements to this day, you know, still innovating. Look at their, um, the constant escapement, for example, from 2000 and what, when was it, uh, 13? They are still doing big, big things. But on the used market, you can pick up some amazing Gerard Perrigo. And I neglected to mention in that video about them, that for a while, they were actually officially licensed to make the, the watches for the Ferrari racing team. So you can pick up some Ferrari uh, Gerard Perigo chronographs for well under $2,000. Very, very cool indeed, especially if you're a big Ferrari fan, check those out. I think they're no longer um, doing that partnership. I think, it, I think Panerai took over or somebody else. Anyway, guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but 
Um, Ferrari fans, uh, <laughs> please uh, do share below if you know. For their vintage, have a look at the Seahawk, you know, beautiful uh, three-handers, their gyromatics, of course. Another honorable mention has to be Balm and Mercier, another iconic Swiss luxury brand. Capelin, the Classissima, the, um, what was the other one? The Clifton, you can buy those all on the used market for well under $2,000. But you know what? It's not their modern offerings that catch my eye. It's their vintage chronographs. They are to die for and in the smaller sizes. Gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. Very, very underpriced. A real sweet spot. They've got an incredible history. Highly underappreciated. In fact, actually, I, I saw one recently and, and this is why it's kind of in my mind and I'm going to be stalking them hard on eBay. <laughs> uh, what else? Oh, Zenith. Of course, Zenith. We cannot neglect to mention Zenith. I've reviewed several Zenith watches in the past, all mostly above the price range we're talking about, but you can actually find some simple mid-century, uh, beautiful hand-wound dress watches from Zenith, even in precious metals for well under 2,000, even around the $1,000 mark. So have a look at Zenith. Anyway, those were my three honorable mentions though, and my top seven, tons and absolute tons to look for. Um, so you guys, you don't have to be stinking rich to buy a Swiss luxury watch, especially something with a bit of horological might to it. There's so much to choose from and have, have fun hunting around. I certainly do. I mean, this is, this is what I, I do it for fun now, you know? Um, so it's an absolute pleasure to share with you guys. And also guys do share your, suggestions in the comments below. I'd love to hear what your recommendations are. Vintage watches, Swiss luxury brands under $2,000. Please do nominate your uh, suggestions in the comments below. Let's try and help out as many people as we can. Hopefully this has inspired some of you. Gonna leave it there. Uh, my throat is <laughs> already hurting. I need some water. Uh, I haven't got any water here. I'm run out, so I'm gonna go and do that. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it, found it useful. And as always, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.